Good morning, Madison. How are you? Oh, let's see. Where is that? Hmm. Yeah, it's been a long semester, haven't it? Hasn't it? Hi, uh, Shaniqua. Hi, uh, Katie. Courtney. Six. Hi, Elizabeth. Hope you had a nice weekend. Hello, Jason. Hello, James. Well, one thing you can do, Courtney, is you can take the the four grades you have for lecture tests, and that'll add them up, divide by four, and that'll give you an approximation of where you are in terms of the lecture. And then I'm not sure I understand exactly how they do the lab. Hey, Madison. Let's see, Madison. Here we go. Do the same thing with your quizzes in lab. Okay, do your quiz grade, add those quiz grades up, divide them by whatever the divisor is, and that'll give you a grade there. Do the same thing with your lab uh, exams, add them up, divide by, if you got four of them, divide by four or whatever. And then uh, homework, you need to go to, let's see, what do they call that? Mastering a and I think it is, and look in there and see what your grades are, add them up and divide by whatever number um, they're supposed to be there, 10, 12, 15, something like that. Hey, Mason, how are you? And Nani. Okay, Nani P. Mason. Madison Oaks, come okay, Madison Oaks, yep. Antonia, okay, are you you call yourself Nini, huh? Okay. I listen to you. Oh, Tamika, okay. Good, good afternoon, Tamika. Well, I'm getting all of it. Um, section five. And one of six.
But I got everybody, just about everybody. Let's see, Courtney, I said, uh, look at mastering a and and Pearson and take all those scores you got, divide them by how many you're supposed to have there, 15 or whatever the number is, 14. Um, that counts as another lecture test. So you can add that to your four lecture tests at this point, divide by four, and that'll give you a lecture average. And then um, add your... Quiz is up, get an average as your lab exams up, get a average, divide, add them up, divide by two, I guess. That'll give you your lab average. Put your lecture down three times, your lab down once, add them up, divide by four. That should give you some sort of a uh, idea of where you stand in terms of passing the course 75 80 whatever okay Okay, well, I think we got everybody that's going to be here. Maybe they'll come in later. Let's do this. Okay, the last thing we talked about. Were we into the I in chapter 15? Is that correct? Okay, Destiny. Okay, Destiny P. Okay, now, in terms of the I in Chapter 15, we want to sort of wrap that up for a minute, and then we got to go back to Chapter 12. So... Was the last thing we talked about in terms of the eye, was that about the rods and the cones? Oops. Okay, good. Okay, we just mentioned the neural layer, didn't we? Okay, so we talked about the fovea centralis and about the uh, macula lutea. Is that correct? Okay, good. And the optic disc. Okay. Okay, and then we just mentioned the... Uh, Let's see if we covered that. We have not covered the chambers yet, have we? The chambers of the eye.
Okay, we have covered the chambers of the uh, Hykira. Kira, are you doing well? Hope you're recovering. Okay, we have not we've not covered those chambers yet. Tamika, you said we covered those chambers? The anterior cavity and the posterior cavity and then the two chambers. Good. Glad to hear that, Kira. Okay, we did not cover those chambers. All right, so we want to uh, quickly go over those and then mention a little bit about the rods and the cones, and then we've got to go back to Chapter 12 and get into the central nervous system. So having said that, let's look on um, page 551. Page 551. Let me see if I can shift this around a little bit. Okay. Ah, what in the world happened there? Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so let's look. Let's look for just a second on 551. And you... You're going to be looking at the first column. Now 51. You're look, going to be looking at figure 1515. 15.15. Sonia, good afternoon. So as you look at that, you're going to be referring to that chamber in just a second. And come down in that first column and you see cavities and chambers of the eye. So as you look into that section, you see it says notice in figure 15.15, da 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 da. Come down to um well, just read the first sentence. It talks about the anterior and the posterior cavities. Page 551, Sonia. And you see in the second line, second line over to the right, it says the large posterior cavity located posterior to the lens, that's behind it, obviously, is filled with gelatinous material called vitreous humor. Now you look at that picture up above, 1515, and you see it says cavities and chambers. Now we're talking about the cavities at this point. There are two main cavities, and you're looking first at this big um, space. It's labeled, uh, if you look at the bottom right of the image or of the Drawing, you see vitreous humor in posterior cavity. So behind the lens is a cavity, and they call it simply the posterior cavity. And it's filled with gelatinous material. And that material keeps the neural layer, we call it the retina. Most of you have heard about the retina. It keeps the retina against the choroid. So you got the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. Retina is the inside, and it's like the screen that picks up the images. It is the screen that picks up the images. And uh, that vitreous humor, that jelly-like material, keeps the retina pressed against the choroid. If the retina becomes detached, that is going to affect a person's vision.
So that's the one, one cavity behind the eye, behind the lens, excuse me. Now, if you look at the uh, picture again up top, you see down at the bottom left of the picture, it talks about anterior chamber, posterior chamber. Those two chambers make up what is called the anterior cavity. So that's a space in front of the lens. Instead of being behind the lens, it's in front of the lens. Now, as you look at that uh, left part of the, the eye image and you look down at the bottom, you see anterior chamber and posterior chamber. That anterior cavity is divided into two chambers. And you see they simply call them anterior and posterior. So as you look where that line goes with the anterior chamber, you see it's pointing to a space that's in front of the iris, but behind the cornea. So that's the limits of the anterior chamber. Space between the iris, the front of the iris, the anterior part of it, and then the posterior part of the cornea. Now, if you come down again to the bottom left of the diagram, figure 1515, we've already mentioned where the anterior chamber is. And then you see the posterior chamber. It is a very small chamber compared to the anterior chamber. But you see it's the tiny little space between the lens and the iris, between the front of the lens and the back of the iris. Very small chamber. The figure is 15.15, 15 15.15. 15 on page 551. Now, if you look carefully where you see posterior chamber, Thank you, Destiny. For those that are looking at an e-text, that's great. Thank you. 1513. Thank you, Kira. And you see that line coming from posterior chamber. You follow it up. It's pointing to the posterior chamber. But look at the little white arrow that goes up. You can look closely. You see a little white line that it bends to the left. You got like a little arrowhead on it. And you see it leads to another arrow. Not error, but arrow. What that is picturing for us is the flow of a liquid that fills the anterior chamber. Actually, the anterior cavity, the whole thing. Where you see, I want you to look up at the top of the diagram now. Look at the top of the diagram, look to the left, and you see ciliary body. Now that ciliary body, I say, that ciliary body, on page 551, figure 1515 for most of us, 1513 if you're looking at the e-text, that ciliary body produces that liquid called aqueous humor. 
aqueous humor. It's down in the paragraph below, a couple of paragraphs below. You'll see in bold print, aqueous humor. Now we think of humor as ha 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 ha, but uh, years ago, they used to call the liquids of the body humors. Blood was a humor. Um, cerebrospinal fluid was a humor and on and on, all those liquids. So the ciliary body produces that aqueous humor. And you can see the little arrows. It's produced by the ciliary body. You follow the arrows. It goes out of the posterior uh, cavity through the pupil. Remember, that's a hole in the iris. And it goes out into the anterior cavity, anterior chamber, excuse me. Posterior chamber and anterior ca uh, chamber. And apparently that cleanses that area. Uh, it may bring nourishment of some sort. But you want to, again, again, have the right amount of aqueous humor. It's just like you want the right amount of blood in your body and the right amount of cerebrospinal fluid that we'll talk about later. I got you, Shay. Now, some of you have, have been wearing glasses, and some of you have had some eye exams. And you probably can say, yeah, they did this to me one time. They uh, take a machine, and they shoot a little puff of air against your cornea. So what they're doing is measuring the pressure in the anterior cavity. Again, you got to have the right amount of pressure. You get too much or too little, you got a problem. We used to check that when I was in the military and we'd do physicals for the soldiers. And one of the things we would do is we would check that uh, pressure inside there. One of the problems that can show up in diabetes is you have too much of that aqueous humor and it creates pressure in the eye, which can actually lead to blindness. As a matter of fact, if you look to your right on page 551, you see a box down at the bottom half that says glaucoma. That's what we were checking for. Is the pressure increasing? Is it decreasing? Or is it within the range of what we call normalcy? Comfortable with that? You can read about glaucoma. And before we leave this page, I want you to look at the top right and you see the word cataracts. It's kind of interesting because they sometimes use the word cataract as a, as a waterfall. But you can read about a cataract. The lens is normally clear. Yours is, mine is, and so forth at this point in our lives. But sometimes you see there in older people, the lens becomes somewhat opaque. It just ages, and it doesn't let as much light in, and that's when they have to do a, a replacement and put an artificial lens in there, which is really pretty successful. Now, you, that's correct, Sonia, but you need to say from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber. Okay, the fluids from the vitreous humor and the uh, aqueous humor and the anterior cavity don't mix. So make sure you put that word chamber in there and you'll be absolutely accurate. There is a flow from the posterior 
chamber to the anterior chamber. And then if you would, as you look at the picture again, look at the picture again, look down there, anterior chamber and posterior chamber, and you see right above them, scleral venous sinus. That's where that fluid drains. So, ciliary body produces that fluid, goes between the uh, lens and the iris, goes out the pupil into the anterior chamber and uh, nourishes those tissues. And then it gets into a little scleral venous sinus where it is put back into the circulatory system. So there's, there's nourishment may be provided, there's cleansing and so forth of that area. Now, last thing we want to cover here about the eye is over uh, several pages, 554. Now, Destiny, perhaps you can give us a little help again uh, in terms of the uh, textbook. We're looking at what's called errors of refraction. That's on page 554. Second column. So there's some terms here I want you to know. As you look in that second column under errors of refraction, you see presbyopia, hyperopia, myopia. So come down to um, the second paragraph. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy. These computers are wonderful when they work, but, boy, when they don't, you're dead in the water. Of course, that's like anything, whether it's a car engine or your air conditioning. You're dead in the water, aren't you? Well, just make some notes. We're on page, page 554 looking at errors of refraction. Okay, Elizabeth Lyman says 1517. Okay. Um, page 553 in the e-text. Thanks, ladies. Appreciate you uh, creating a fuller picture. So there's some terms I want you to know as you come down to the second paragraph. Emetropia. And that means the shape of the eye is what it should be. It's supposed to have a particular shape for light to fall on the, the retina so you can see what you're looking at. Of course, you interpret what you're looking at back here. We'll mention that when we get to chapter 12. Maybe not today, but maybe Thursday. So you see in metropia, that means that the eyeball is normal, anterior to posterior. You come to hyperopia, and that means far-sighted, hyper, more, uh, opia, okay? But the eyeball is shortened. As you look down below in figure 1520, you see what's normal in A, part A, in metropia. We focus the light on our retina, but in hyperopia, the eyeball is short, so the image actually forms behind our eye. And that's why we need some glasses to change the image, uh, correct that uh, problem, so you can actually see in clarity. So hyperopia means you're farsighted. It's kind of a contradiction here. You see it says the eyeball is too short. It is, that's a little confusing, isn't it? You think, well, the eyeball's got to be longer. It's hyperopia. And opia means, you know, I understand, 
It's just the way it is. And then you come down to the bottom and you see myopia, nearsightedness, and therefore, therefore the eyeball is too long. The image is formed in front of the neural tissue layer, the retina, okay? So you want to know about those. And then uh, over on page 555, we've got a couple of things to mention. Astigmatism, bold print term under the uh, bold print term myopia. So you're, we're doing astigmatism. Got some irregularity in the cornea. So those are some challenges that a lot of people face. Don't have any problem with their eyes. They just wonderfully got some great genes. They don't have to wear any bifocals or whatever. So as you look on 555, you look at the second column. Thank you. You look at the second column and you see the photoreceptors of the retina or and the retina. They picture those photoreceptors in figure 1521. Those are the cells that pick up the images for us. Look how look at those cells. There's about three or four of them in a row, but the last ones are what they call the rods and the cones. And you've probably heard about rods and cones before. I look at all of that and I'm just overwhelmed. I, it just excites me to look at this and learn about it and to say a few things to you about it. Very complicated structure. But if you look at the structure, you see where, look at the very bottom of that illustration and you see the word light. Light comes in there. That's sort of, that's the front of the retina and passes through and it hits the choroid, the back of the, uh, that tissue, back of the, of, um, the eyeball. Now, you, you don't have to be able to identify rods and cones, but you see to the right, you see rods and cones. They are built differently. Now, a couple of things I want you to know. The rods help us to see in dim light. The cones, which you can see on page 555, same page, second column, last sentence. Cones contain pigments that allow us to perceive color. So the cones help us to see during the light part of the day, but they also help us see color. And, you know, some people are colorblind. So they have some defective cones that prevents them from appreciating the color green or the, the color blue or whatever. Just fascinating, all this stuff about light. There's so much more to it, but we just don't have time to do it. So you look on 556 in the first column, and it says up at the top, 556. You see the bold print term rods. It says it cannot detect color, but they're very sensitive and capable of responding in less intense light. Please wait while we try connect, reconnecting. Don't see just in black and white. It's just they can't make out the color green, let's say, or the color red. So there's, it's not, not that you just totally see black and white. That's logical to think like what you're thinking, but I don't know that that's the case. And I don't think that. Now, we covered the fovea centralis, the center of the retina. Look in this paragraph where you see rods in bold print. I want you to come down five lines, one, two, three, four, five. 
And you see the word fovea centralis. We talked about that structure. Now, what you want to remember in the middle, in the fovea centralis, that's where you have millions of cones. Millions of cones. Sharp vision is possible. Very um, sharp vision in the sense of looking at details, recon recognizing depth. You know, your nose sticks out from your face and so forth. Then when you're looking somebody head on, you know, it sticks in the front of their face. So you pick up on those things, the depth and so forth. So you got all these rock, these cones in the center as you move out to the perimeter, or you can say the periphery, the edge. It's easier to spell, isn't it, than perimeter and periphery. But anyway, as you move out, the number of cones diminishes. As you move to the edge, though, the number of rods increases. So you don't have any rods in the center of your field of vision, but you have a lot of them around the periphery, or around the edge of the retina. Well, acuity means sharp, like a knife, acute, like you have a cute sore throat. It comes on very fast and hits very hard. Um, uh, sometimes they use a word called acumen, which means sharpness of mind. And some people say, oh, this person's got real business acumen. Well, it's, they're saying it's very sharp. So that's why in the center of our eye, we have high acuity, sharpness of vision. So you got a lot of rods on the outside, no cones out there. Got a lot of cones in the middle, no rods there. Now, something you may have done in this your life, in your lifetime, one of the things I've always enjoyed doing is looking up at the stars and just uh, appreciating their beauty and um, wondering about them, so to speak. And some of the stars are in little clusters. There's a little group called the Pleiades. P L E P L E A D E S, I think it is, Pleiades, I think that's right. Might have an I in there somewhere. But anyway, that's a group of about seven or eight little stars that are close together. And if you look directly at them, they disappear because they're, they're millions of light years away, and they're somewhat dim. You can tell there's something there. But if you look directly at it, it disappears. But if you look just to the side, one side or the other, your rods pick up that light. And then you can see those. And sometimes you can see them fairly clearly on a nice uh, clear night where you don't have a lot of haze and pollution and Moisture in the atmosphere. It's pretty neat. In the military, they taught us about night firing. You know, the enemy tries to get you at night. Well, you don't look at your enemy. You look just to the side of where you think he is, and then you can see the shadow. And then you take your rifle and you put a hole in him. So they taught us how to use our night vision, we would call it. Everybody okay with rods and cones? Okay, but we're going to stop in just a second. I want you to look down at the bottom where it's the structure of photoreceptors. We're not going to get into all that detail, but I want you to look at the second and third paragraphs under the structure of photoreceptors.
When you come down to the second paragraph, it talks about rods have an outer segment that's shaped like a cylinder. You don't have to know all of that detail. I want you to come down to this one, two, three, four line. It says pigment rhodopsin. Pigment rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is in uh, bold print. It is a substance that helps us see at night. Sometimes they call it visual purple. But I want you to know, as you look down, you see it says rhodopsin has two components, the protein opsin and the pigment retinol. Now, some of you may know of a drug called retinol. I've had contact with a drug. It helped a lot in taking care of a problem I have. But those two substances come together and they help you see at night. Now come down to the next paragraph and it says, like rods, cones are named because of the shape of their segments. Don't worry about that. Um, but it says the discs and the cones are infoldings of the plasma membrane. Boy, there we are, phospholipid bilayer again, right? You can't get away from the phospholipid bilayer. It is all throughout our body. And you see it says contains the pigment Iodo, excuse me, iodopsin, iodopsin. Iodopsin is made of two compounds, retinol and the protein photopsin. So you have opsin and you have photopsin. What's the difference? They're both proteins. Go back into how we've talked about that. What's the difference in those proteins? It would be the type of amino acid that's used, the sequence of the amino acids, the number of amino acids, and ultimately that defines the shape of the protein. See, trying to get you to continue thinking and putting stuff together like that. Yeah, whether it's a protein in your mouth to, to dissolve uh, carbohydrates or whether it's a protein to uh, help you see at night. Sequence of letters, just like spelling. Get the right letter in the right place and have the right number of letters. Okay? So we're going to leave chapter 15, and we're going to go to chapter 12. This is going to be part of the uh, exam number five. I'm going to build me some kind of a structure here so I can hold this book up. Well, you could throw that book at somebody and take them out. You know, that's a heavy book. Four twenty-five is the page that I'm on. I'm not sure where that is, destiny, in terms of the e text, but if you find it, let us know so we can all be there. Back in chapter twelve. Well, it's a nice day to be outside, isn't it? I would be out there on the patio behind our house, but all that sunlight would wash out the screen. Where are you, Mr. Princeton? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Okay, now I'm on page 425. What you got there, Destiny? Chapter 12.1, you're correct. That's right. And what we're going to be looking at is uh, a heading that says basic structure of the brain and spinal cord. That's what we're going to cover uh, in terms of um, the central nervous system. Now, you already know the central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. So we're going to get into some more detail. Fascinating structure. Fascinating structure. And, of course, the brain is within the cranium. It's protected. 
Uh, not only by bone, but we'll get into some of the, the membranes that are inside it. It's just, it's beautiful to me. That's why I'm in this business. It's just beautiful to me. So you look in the second column. And you see it says that the uh, brain and spinal cord are anatomically continuous. We set up the, uh, the difference uh, between the brain and the spinal, or the spinal cord and the what we call the brain stem eventually. We're going to look at that. Now notice uh, what it says about the brain in that first paragraph. If you come down six lines, six lines in the second column, And you should see a sentence that says it, referring to the brain, has internal cavities. Somebody says you got a hole in your head. We do. We've got a number of holes in there, but they play a very important role. It has internal cavities called ventricles. Now, as soon as I mention ventricle, you start thinking heart, don't you? It's only natural. That's right. Got a couple of ventricles there. But you see it says it has ventricles inside that are filled with cerebrospinal fluid. They will um, abbreviate that many times, CSF, central, excuse me, cerebrospinal fluid. Let's come down to, let's see, that was 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I think it's about 12. Yeah, the next paragraph, actually, next paragraph says the brain's richly supplied with blood vessels. During rest, about 20% of the total blood flow in the body goes to the brain. Uses a lot of energy, uses a lot of oxygen. I don't know that you can think yourself uh, so much, think so much that you lose weight <laughs> if you need to, but uh, it uses energy and you got to have it. And it only uses glucose. Now come down to the next paragraph and you see it says the brain consists of four divisions. And though each division is going to be divided into various components. So it's, you're going to have to go over this and over this and over this and over this. So you see the four divisions, the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Now, what I want you to do in just a moment is we're going to, we're going to look at a part, and then we're going to turn to that page. Now, I think I'm right in that you are or you're having close you're getting close to the time that you're going to have a, a lab exam on the nervous system is that right or have you already had that i don't know but you've seen it so it shouldn't be too i think you've seen it so you it shouldn't be anything foreign to you so as you look in this same column you see cerebrum Enlarged to superior portion of the brain. Got two halves, two hemispheres. And so as you <clears throat> come on down past the two cerebral hemispheres, right and left hemispheres, uh, you see it says each hemisphere has five lobes. We will look at those lobes in just a few minutes. And you probably have looked at those. So, um, oh, you're about to do that, right? Destiny, you're about to look at the brain. Okay. And you see, come on, if you come on down, um, Pass where it says cerebral hemispheres, come down one, two uh, lines, and you see to the right, go to the right in that sentence, it says the cerebrum is responsible for higher mental functions. That means thinking about anatomy and physiology. That means thinking about algebra. 
That means thinking about English as you read and as you uh, think about statements that are made in a book that you'd like to read. Ah, okay. So, so you're going to have a, a test on the brain. Well, maybe this will help you get through it. That's great. So you see it says higher mental functions. And then you see it says it includes learning. Here we are. Memory, got to do that, right? Plays a role in sensation and movement, language, thinking. They call it cognition. You'll hear people talk about the cognitive powers of such and such a person. And they're talking about, I mean, saying think fast. Some people think more quickly than others. It's like some people can run faster than others. So now let's look over on the next page. I'm on 426 and I'm looking at figure 12.1. And so you see up at the top, the big part that's kind of light brown, that's what we call the cerebrum differently in a few minutes, but you, I have the cerebrum there. And we'll talk about the surface of the cerebrum in just a few minutes, but not right yet. So look to the right, and you see this table. And you see the line pointing to the cerebrum. You can see all the little valleys and, and the little raised areas and so forth. And you see, again, over there under function, Higher mental functions, interprets sensory stimuli, uh, plans, and initiates movement. And like it said, we have memory uh, so that if we see something beginning to materialize, we remember we've been there before, say in a car, somebody's going to do something without thinking. You know, we all sometimes are guilty of doing things that you think, why did I do that? And people say, you weren't thinking. Yeah, that has something to do with it. That's why you have to be alert when you're driving. Okay, so you got the cerebrum. Now go back over to page 425 and come down that second column and you see the next uh, part is, I tell you what, let's do, no, that's okay, we'll do that. Next we got the diencephalon. Page 425. Now, die is a root word for two, isn't it? Diurnal, okay? Day and night and so forth. Say, get it busy during the day. Um, it's actually got four structures. Now, we're not going to get into all those structures. We're going to get into two of them, but there are other structures that we just don't have time to, to talk about. So as you look on page 425, and you're in that second column, and you come down, and it says it's got four distinct structural components. It's responsible for processing, integrating. That's where we put two or three things together to make a decision about how to respond to something, relaying information to different parts of the brain. Got to have this guy. Homeostatic mechanisms, homeostatic functions. Now, for the most part, you know, in terms of homeostatic functions, we think of uh, temperature in the body. We think of blood pressure in the body. But there are, I think there are probably hundreds of homeostatic mechanisms that we, maybe we haven't even dealt with before. Think about how your, your iris works. That's a homeostatic mechanism, too. We, it, it'll it close down if you're in too bright a light to try and protect the retina. And it'll open up at night to let you have more light. That's a balance, see? Homeostasis. Marvelous structures. And you see it talks about regulation of movement and biological rhythms. Now you look back over on page 426. That's right, Sonia. 
there is a mess of homeostasis going on that we don't even know about. We don't even think about. We don't even recognize it sometimes. As you look on page 426, uh, you see that sort of kind of bluish purple um, structure. And you look at the little line that says that's your diencephalon. So you see your diencephalon is under, sort of encased, uh, covered by the cerebrum. And you look over to the right, processes integration, relays information, da 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 da. Homeostasis. Homeostasis. Boy, we need, and we don't even have to think about it. The plan is made. It works like your air conditioning circuit. Hit the button, and next thing you know, you're comfortable. All right, let's go back to. The cerebellum. And you see down there at the bottom of page 425, you've got the uh, cerebellum uh, composed of right and left hemispheres. Figures important in planning and coordination of movement. Complex activities such as playing a sport. Think of Simone Biles again. She's got to know where she is in the middle of the air, and that cerebellum helps her accomplish those beautiful movements, those beautiful coordinated movement, movements. And, but that's also true in, in other people uh, that, don't, that can't do all the flips that she does, but a person who's in ballet and has got to do the, what do they call it, pirouettes and all that stuff. There was a guy who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He took ballet so that he could be a better wide receiver. And boy, was he a good one. Like a gazelle, man, just a gazelle. Beautiful. Anyway, those are some of the basic functions there of the cerebellum. And if you go back over to page 426. I'm getting my paper away from each other. You see the kind of, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, Salmon colored, as opposed to pink or orange, salmon color. And you see where it's located. It's underneath the uh, back of the um, cerebrum. And again, it tells you some of the functions. So you want to be not be able to not only identify this, maybe on, as an illustration on a test, but the function, and we'll get into a little bit more in terms of the function a little bit later. So now let's go back to page 425. And you look at the last quarter, can we use, it's not evenly divided like that in terms of volume, but uh, is the brainstem. Now they'll say that's the oldest part of the brainstem. Now that's the idea that all, this, all these neurons just came together by chance over millions of years. We don't have any evidence that chemicals can come together and produce stuff like that. That's the problem. But this is what people think, and I'm not going to require you to know that, but you basically in terms of function, look at the second line. It says the brain stem connects the brain and the spinal cord. So that section that we call the brain stem connects the brain to the spinal cord. And you know that there can be accidents, there can be wrecks and things like that where a portion of the spinal cord is severed. Get my hand up here where it goes across like that. There you go. So it cuts through and you don't have any communication. It's like cutting your um, power cord to your computer. Of course, you probably got a battery in there. I understand that. But you get the basic idea. If it didn't have a battery, you cut the cord, you're dead in the water. You lost control of what you want to see on the computer. So as you read on page 425, functions include involuntary homeostatic functions, reflexes, if I remember correctly, 
the vomiting reflex is in the midbrain, uh, excuse me, the uh, brain stem. That's a reflex to get rid of stuff that we don't uh, want in our body. Or at least the body says, you don't want this stuff in there. Let's get it out. And it does it whether we're trying to watch a show or go to sleep or whatever. Okay. So you look over on page 426. And you see this kind of, a, I'd call it a purple type structure. Uh, it's labeled the brain stem. It goes all the way up there to where you see the diencephalon. And that's your fourth, we would say, I guess, major component. The major component, fourth major component of the brain. So you got four parts, basically. Cerebrum, diencephalon, cerebellum. Midbrain. And now you know a little bit about their function. Now go back to page 425. This is going to give you a, um, a little bit more insight into what happens outside. And you have some understanding about this, I don't doubt. Bottom of page 425, you see spinal cord. Long tubular organ encased by vertebra you probably have seen that you've probably seen the model where you got a bulging disc and it tends to displace a nerve and that's when people have pain or sometimes have numbness in a certain area but anyway um you see it says the spinal cord begins at the foramen magnum big hole in our head we've got a number of holes in our head right our blood vessels can go and nerves can come out, cranial nerves and so forth. And if you follow over to 426, the cord itself, the cord as a solid structure, ends about L2, which is lumbar vertebra 2. Well, um, Sonia, think about, you say brain stem cells so important. Think about all the things that we've talked about that are sort of, um, we don't have to have any command, a conscious command over them, but they connect. A lot of parts of the brain also set up these homeostatic mechanisms and these reflexes that we don't have to worry about. If something is wrong, the reflex is going to try to write the ship, so to speak, keep the body in good shape and keep it healthy. It's set up to do that. I don't know if that answers your question, but those brain stem cells, I see you're saying, maybe you're saying stem cells. You're emphasizing the word stem, maybe. I'm not sure. You know, you got the structure called the brain stem and it's made up of cells. But then we talk about stem cells, don't we? Whether we take... Yeah, well, <clears throat> usually some pretty good damage is done to the brain stem. It affects the person for the rest of their lives because those cells typically lose their um, – those, remember those little um, centrioles that play a role in division? The they lose those. And we say lose them. Well, why did we lose them? All we can do sometimes is say we don't understand that, but we observe that. That is a lot of science. We see it, but we do not understand what's going on. But some people would probably try to find stem cells say like in your red bone marrow. And if they could put those cells, the bone marrow cells, before they get to growing into white cells or red cells, if you could put them in with a bunch of neurons, supposedly they would turn into neurons. 
We all have those stem cells where they are going to become certain structures, neurological, muscular, and so forth. So people are looking at, can we take those bone marrow cells and place them in an area of damage where those cells that are not damaged would stimulate that cell to become a brain cell as opposed to a red blood cell. That is amazing, isn't it? Just amazing. And we've had some success with uh, a few things like that. We're just on the edge of it. It doesn't mean we get it all together. We'll never have it all together. Okay. Now, look on page 426, and let's look at the first column. And I want you to come down three lines. And you see 1.25 centimeters, da, 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 da. Go over it in the sentence to like the brain, the spinal cord has an internal cavity. Now that's the spinal cord. You've got that right, uh, Sonia. You have got that right. And you see it says uh, the spinal cord has an internal cavity filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Its cavity is the central canal. Now we'll get to that eventually but it's a tiny little canal that runs the length of the cord. And we, you'll see how it connects with the brain a little bit. With, we've still got that to go. Not today, but uh, come Thursday. Um, and is continuous with the ventricles of the brain. So it's all connected together. Isn't that amazing? Got two, two big cavities up here. Got one right in the middle. Then we got a little fourth one right, right underneath the cerebellum that we talked about, but it's in the brain stem, the cavities in the brain stem, right about where the, uh, the cerebellum is above it. And then that cavity goes on down as a central canal all the way th to the end of the cord. And it's got cerebrospinal fluid in it. Now that, that's going to have to suffice it until we get into it a little bit more deeply. So as you look on 426, and you look at the next paragraph, you see the term white matter and gray matter. You remember the difference? How would you differentiate white matter and gray matter? What does that mean? Somebody pop off in the next 10 seconds or so, 15. Else I'll pop off. Okay, remember, uh, myelinated, that's right, Shaniqua, very good. And so we have matter, which is neurological matter in this case. And if it's not myelinated, it's considered gray. And like you say there, uh, Elizabeth, white matter has myelinated axons, that lipid type of covering, okay, that's like insulation. So we have white matter and gray matter in the brain. Now look down at the picture. This is actually a picture of the brain, figure 12-2. And you see there are a couple of uh, names and lines pointing to structures. So as you look at that sagittal section of that brain, you see where it says cerebral gray matter. It doesn't look gray in the picture. It looks kind of darker brown, doesn't it? But then you see it says central cerebral gray matter. And then you look to the right and it says, says cerebral white matter. That's myelinated matter. You will hear people say uh, about the gray matter is that's where you think. The white matter connects various parts of the right side of your brain to the left side of your brain so that we 
can look at a situation and we put a number of pieces of information together and we respond to that situation. So they say we do our thinking up there in that corte uh, cortex, not cortex, but cortex, C-O-R-T-E-X, which is like bark, okay? When they talk about cortical tissue, that's tissue on the outside. But those are the, the gray matter where we they say we do our thinking. So somebody says, boy, you're not using your gray matter. Well, that's what they're saying. They're saying you're not thinking. Well, you know, we have to be taught how to think, don't we? And that's some of my job, not only to present information to you, but how do you put it together and discern what needs to be done, whether it's a uh, Take some problem in the house or whether it's part of the problem with a car or uh, in your case, you're going to be in the medical profession. So you're going to be thinking about a person's body and how things might not be connected like they should be. So anyway, you understand now the white matter, myelinated tissue connects um, gray matter from one lobe to another, from one section to another. And if you would, just look to your right. We've got a few more minutes here, uh, about three, I think. Um, so you look to your right and see there's a um, cross section of the spinal cord. And you see gray matter. It's kind of darker brown. And the white matter is lighter, spinal white matter. So the gray matter looks kind of like some people say it looks like a butterfly. And that's fine. If it helps you remember that, that's okay. But it's on mild magnet. And the area outside of that that surrounds the gray matter is what they call white matter, myelinated material, tracts, T-R-A-C-T, -T, tracts that connect. Okay, now before we go, look on page 428. 428. I'm looking at section 12-2. Boy, that works good. Page 12-2. Not 12-2, excuse me. It's section 12-2, page 428. And as you look on page 428, you see these pictures of the brain. And you want to know how to label those structures. There's nothing real heavy about them. Now, you can read in here um, about what they are. A sulcus is a valley and a gyrus is a little raised area and so forth. And so these are identifying features on the cerebrum. You've got some shallow grooves, which are called sulci. And you have some deeper grooves, which are called fissures. The earth has fissures. Deep fissures like the Grand Canyon, where a lot of erosion took place and, and uh, made a, they call it sometimes they call it the big ditch. So, you want to know those terms, you want to know the lobes. Okay, so you want to know frontal lobe, see what separates them the central sulcus from the parietal lobe then you got an occipital lobe and a temporal lobe and so forth and you got a fifth lobe you look down at the bottom right and you see insula some of you know what a peninsula is it's kind of like a strip of land that sticks out this is the insula covered by the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe and then what I want you to do is look over on page, um, you know, those, those terms, fissures and sulci and so forth. Look on the next page, 429. You see the lobes of the cerebrum. And you want to know those lobes functions. For instance, As you look at the lobes of the cerebrum, page 429, first column, frontal lobes. Come down to the last sentence. The neurons of the frontal lobe are responsible for planning and executing movement and complex mental, fun mental functions. 
dealing with behavior, conscience, personality. So I had to set up, I had to use my frontal lobe this morning as I wrote down an agenda to take care of. I had to go pick up a little camera for a computer, you know, and I had to drop off a check here. And then I got back in and here we are at 1230 and I'm going to go get a little something in my tummy because it's empty. So <clears throat> basically the last sentence is there on, under parietal, temporal, occipital, and insula. Um, and they, they're not even sure what the insula does. They would have to take some creature like a mouse and if they have an insula like we do, then they would expose that and they would destroy part of it and see how that mouse responds. That's oftentimes how we learn what the insula in our head does. We use a little mouse, which nobody gets upset with a mouse. You know, if you've got a mouse in your house, you would, most of you would probably be going out the front door. So... <laughs> Nobody gets upset if we use a mouse to study things with. Okay, do you have any questions so far? We have run out of time. And I'm looking forward to meeting you at 1230 on Thursday. We will continue through chapter 12. Some of you may wonder when we're going to have a fifth test. It won't be next week. It'll probably be um, probably be the five, maybe, I don't know. It just depends on how much we cover. We might have to do the fifth test next week and then our exams a week later. But anyway, you see that you need to start talking to the door. Teach the door about the sections of the brain and the functions that are associated with those sections. If you can do that, you can ace the test. Okay. I see somebody's lost their ability to make judgment. What's what cerebral hemisphere is affected? See, it's a little bit of an application type thing, understanding what things are, where things are, what they do, and then it shows up in behavior. Okay? All right. You guys have a nice afternoon. Maybe take a little walk or something and enjoy some sunshine. Destiny, I thought our final was the only thing left. No, we have a fifth test. We have a fifth test. Okay, probably have it next uh, Thursday or something like that. And then the following week, we'll have a final. We've been allowed to extend that because of some of the way things have been changed thanks to this virus. Okay. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, What is that, Destiny? <laughs> is that somebody's head with his mouth open or something like that? I'm not sure what that is. Okay. I'm, so I'm, I'm lost on what you're trying to tell me about it. All right. End of today. <laughs>